about it, you know? So it's like, I have to control myself not to say, okay, now let's go to page. <laughs> if you think that's good. But I do think like, if you're really feeling inspiration, Lauren, like, like one of the feedback I had for you from our first meeting is when you did interject, it felt like you go to the jazz club and like there's an ensemble and then like Duke Ellington step, steps up and offers a solo and then steps back from the mic. Right. So if you are really feeling something, I encourage you to improvise. Okay. Like people would be thrilled, you know. Well, thank you, Emily. I really appreciate your feedback because you know, I, I, uh, if I feel that uplift that I can't like sit still and I need to share, I will. And, okay, good. And I'll be uplifted by your confidence there. Yeah, it's you like it great, inspires people like to feel great that. Musical and great art geniuses. We lost Milford Graves today. Oh my God, I didn't know. Yeah, Milford wow. Grave died. And he's probably, his kinesthetic, his body skill awareness was so honed that when he was told like 20 years ago that he had congenital heart failure, he learned to uh, amplify his heart and play drums with it. Yeah. He's kept himself alive for at least a decade because of percussion oh. instrumentation of his heart. Wow. I think we probably have to let folks in. Okay. Yeah, we Although, lost him and Chick Corea. To to what? We lost him and Chick Corea then just the last couple of days. Yeah. Funny how you have to plug speakers in to, to make them work. Diego! Hi. Snow? Hi. Yeah, it, it was snowing. Oh my god i can't believe you're all the way across the country i miss you yeah. already i miss you too everyone hi susan hello everyone and welcome hi. while everyone's signing in we are going to do something new this week that i'm thrilled to introduce so everybody has been sending in their embroideries. And so what we've decided to do moving forward is feature a new embroidery every week. And in this package, I have something so exciting. This is from Ida Ferdman. Um, it was beautifully wrapped up and it's, it's, it's such a treat. I can't wait for you all to see it. Let's see, it is the native bumblebee. I don't know if, if you guys can see that clearly. Beautiful. And I'm just going to oh, zoom in on the lettering, which I find oh. stunning. Oh. And so what we're going to do is, well, like I said, we're going to show a new one each week. Mm -hmm. And during the duration of this call to, uh, Zoom today, I will feature it back here. And um, at the end, we'll show more of what we're working on too. Okay, let's see. Hopefully you can see that. What are you showing, Jen? I'm sorry. I'm showing the embroidery of the week. Oh, beautiful. So we get so many beautiful ones, but each one deserves its moment in the, in the, in the dark. I was going to say the moment of the sun, but <laughs> it's the moment on the dark black. Um, so we thought we'd show one a week so that we just got. Who's is that, Jen? This is Ida Ferdman, and I don't believe Ida is joining us tonight. Um, I didn't see uh, her name on the list. But um, so I will just introduce it for everyone who's just signed on. Um, my name's Jen. And what we're gonna do for the next like five, 10 minutes as we're all still streaming in is kind of informally introduce ourselves. So I'll start, I'm Jen, I'm calling in from Studio City. I use she, her pronouns. And tonight I will be working on white sage. I'm like so close to finishing it. And so I will now pass it on to Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy, I'm calling from West Covina. And I am working on this butterfly hair tonight. And I will pass it on to Maria. Oh, Maria, I think you're muted.
I'm Maria, and I live in Los Angeles. I, she, her are my pronouns. And I'm going to finish up this, um, oh, this flower. I'm drawing a blank on it right now. It's a it poppy. poppy. It's a poppy. Yes, the poppy. And I'm going to finish it up tonight. I don't have, I, I'm starting to add green to it, which I didn't know if it, it was supposed to have green, but plants have green leaves. So I'm going to put some green in there um, because it just seemed kind of flat without a contrasting color at the edge. And I will turn it on to Izzy. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Izzy. I'm calling in from Mid City, Los Angeles. Uh, my pronouns are she, they. And tonight I am working on, uh, I just started the a mule fat, which I don't know if you can see because of my fi plant filter, but it's kind of blending in there. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I will pass it on to Roxanne. Hi, I'm Roxanne. She, her, I'm in Venice and um, I haven't decided what I'm going to work on yet. <laughs> I have a few things behind my desk here. So um, I'm really excited to be with you all and I will pass it on to Vicky. Hi there, I'm Vicki. I go by sheer pronouns and um, I have already sent in all my embroidery. So I sent in a request for a, a new package. I don't know if you're gonna be sending one to me or not, but if you want to, I look forward to uh, starting a new one. And I don't have it out with me right now, but uh, Luce from Piece by Piece gave me a piece of embroidery that someone gave her as a donation a while ago. So I can also start on that, but it's not here with me right now. We'll send it uh, out to you this week, Vicki. All right. My, okay. Yeah. Thank you. I live in Santa Monica and um, I pass it on to Olan Jones. Hey, Olan Jones. I use she, her pronouns. I'm in West Hollywood and I only ever work on this piece of embroidery. <laughs> <laughs> it's been years. years now. <laughs> And tonight I'm going to venture into the French knot. <laughs> I shall pass this on. I gotta get to the gallery here. Diego Blanco. Hi, um, I'm Diego. Uh, my pronouns are he, him. And I'm calling from uh, Ithaca, New York. Um, I would be working on an avocado today, but I don't have the cloth with me just yet, just the threads. So that'll be next time. So I guess for today, I'll just be drawing. Um, and I'll pass it on to Lee. Did you say Lee? Hi, I'm Lee. I use she, her pronouns. And I'm wearing a necklace. I don't know if this shows. This is what I've been working on since I've finished my embroideries and waiting for a new one. And it has um, a frog and various turquoises in it uh, representing water and transformation of life. And I will, let's see who's here that I can pass. Aaron, take it away. Hello, I'm uh, Aaron Collin from Los Angeles by the river, Metabolic Studio. I refer to myself with he and him, and I'm going to be organizing some computer files and driving home tonight while listening to y'all. And I pass it to, uh, let me see, Emily, did you go yet? Hi, Emily here. Uh, she, her pronouns, calling in from right near the LA River um, in Lincoln Heights. And yes, I'm going to be helping facilitate the screen share and moving us through our reading section tonight. And I'm just going to be deep listening and enjoying sharing this space together. So thank you so much. Let me call upon 
Rowena, if you would like to introduce yourself. Hello, I'm Rowena. I use she, her pronouns. I'm in Los Angeles and I'm working on the native bee. Good to see everyone. Happy Friday. I will pass it to Millie. Hi, I'm Millie. Um, I'm also calling near the Alley River in Glassell Park. I am coincidentally a bundling white sage um, that comes from our beautiful moon as an intention to for Lunar New Year. Um, I'm going to be gifting these to several women that support me. Um, yeah. I want to pass it on to Walker Rowling. Hi, I am Walker Rollins. Um, I'm a beekeeper and I'm just joining uh, this group today. And I don't have a embroidery needle and I haven't read any of the readings. I'm just entering this and I'm looking forward to it. Hey Lee. Um, and I'm thankful that you're all here and I'm with you. And who am I passing to? Um, what about Lee Adams? I just went, so I'm going to point. Oh, <laughs> I just I am going to point the finger at Alex Tanasi. Hi, Lee. <clears throat> I'm Alex. Um, um, I'm not too sure what I'm going to be doing yet. Maybe some drawing or some embroidery um, uh, while I'm listening with you guys. It's great to see everybody. Hello. Uh, I'd like to pass it to Caroline. Have you spoken yet? I, I showed up a little late. No, I didn't speak yet. Hello, good evening, everyone. Caroline, and uh, I will be listening tonight. And um, maybe if I can finish some shoe, I will do that. I will be listening mostly. I'll pass it to. Uh, Actually, I'm going to interrupt at this point because it seems that everybody is here now. Um, and if you haven't had the opportunity to introduce yourself and share what you're working on, we will have an opportunity later in this evening. But I just want to say welcome. Um, the Metabolic Studios Learning and Mending series is now in its third evolution. This time around, we're addressing suffocation. Growing through the last two gatherings, the first learning syllabus in response to ongoing racial violence, particularly at the hands of the police, and the second holding space for the mega fires that consume the West. And now with the advent of COVID-19, we feel it's imperative to address the larger reality of suffocation and the need for us to revive our breath. In order to get a deeper understanding of these crises and how they are interconnected, we're building upon the readings in the last two series abolitionist writings by black women and Native American perspectives of land stewardship. Since the ongoing pandemic began, we have moved our weekly public studio practice to Zoom where we've committed ourselves to learning and mending together. We invite you to receive these readings as a deep inhale as we find that crafting together helps to receive these readings as a meditation. Many of you have received embroidery kits from us of native plants representing the food and medicine that Metabolic Studio is cultivating. In addition to those, we are happy to include a new pattern based on biosynosis, which is an association of diverse organisms forming a closely integrated community. So I'm gonna hold up the drawing because the embroidery was too light, but this is the next iteration that will be um, sent out. So. If you'd like to receive an embroidery kit, please send your name and mailing address to info at metabolicstudio.org. And at this time, um, Carolyn, I'm sorry, Cindy will put that information in the chat bar. 
Um, we've decided to close the entrance to the Zoom space after the first 15 minutes of the reading to protect the flow and to keep a steady breath. These gatherings are being recorded through Zoom for archival purposes. We thank you for co-creating this opportunity to learn and mend together during this quarantine. Tonight, we're gonna to read from Anna Singh, um, chapter 11, The Life of the Forest from Of the Mushroom at the End of the World on the Possibility of Life in Capitalist Ruins. We will, sh we will share our screen and we encourage you to read a section of the text aloud with us. When there is a pause in the reading, please feel free to unmute yourself and begin where the last person left off. Silence is golden and there is no pressure to fill the, the transitional spaces <clears> while we enjoy a breath and continue crafting. Feel free to jump in and continue reading at your comfort level. You don't have to read. It's also fine to just enjoy the listening. Now I pass it over to Izzy. Thanks, Jen. Um, so I'm gonna be um, beginning with some breath work, some guided breath work for us all to participate in. Um, and tonight the breath work is, I think kind of more informed by the text. And so there's a moment in the beginning of the text, uh, the mushroom at the end of the world. Sorry, I don't think you can see it. But Singh is talking about being lost in a forest in Oregon's Cascade Mountains. And um, earlier that day, she had found a camp of mushroom pickers in the mountains in the forest, but they were out foraging. And so she decided to look around for mushrooms herself, but described the forest as being incredibly unpromising. Dry, rocky ground, um, sorry, my dogs are barking very loudly. Uh, little growth besides the log pole line. And as she was lost in this seemingly desolate forest, a truck pulled up next to her and um, offered her a ride. So in the truck were two men, both from Mean Hills of Laos, who had come from a refugee camp in Thailand in the 80s and Singh accompanied them to their camp. And at dusk, she went picking with them. And she explains this uh, sense of confusion as she initially saw nothing but dirt in the forest, just dirt, rock, and scrawny pines. And she writes, uh, but here was Cow with his bucket and stick, poking deep into clearly empty ground and pulling up a fat Matsutake button. How could this be possible? There had been nothing there. And then, there it was. So I really like this moment in the text, which we won't be reading tonight, but I wanted to bring it up because uh, I think Singh really beautifully and later on in that section comically describes her first encounter and pull into this wild maze of Matsutake mushrooms and the ecology and economy around them. Um, but for the sake of this breath work, I think that this moment speaks to awareness because uh, her first chapter in this text is called The Art of Noticing. And I want us to begin with noticing because um, a lot of our reading for tonight talks about landscape as a place in which stories can be told. And I think, you know, our body itself is a landscape um, and it's a place where stories can be told. And I think like, you know, our landscape has the stories of cells and organs and tissues and all these separate little beings inside of us with their own time scales and perspectives, but they also make up who we are. So I wanna begin with a body scan for tonight uh, to bring our notice to our body as a landscape composed of various forms of life. And sometimes, you know, we don't see that Matsutake mushroom buried in the dirt and the rock. Uh, we just are in autopilot mode. And so I invite you to maybe turn off autopilot. And as we breathe, scan your body as a landscape. Um, and don't worry about changing the landscape, just kind of noticing um, that hidden Matsutake mushroom. So uh, I ask that we all close our eyes if you're comfortable with that. And take a deep inhale. Beginning to Breathe awareness into the crown of our head. Exhale. And just continue that breath and maybe invite uh, some relaxation into the face muscles and 
separate the lips and relax the tongue. You can just notice maybe you're clenching your jaw or you know you're tightening your eyes and just in, invite relaxation but also um, you know I don't we don't have to be critical of those things necessarily just notice maybe there's tension in the shoulders or in the fingertips, in the hands, in the elbows. As you breathe, just kind of think about these various parts of our bodies. Maybe you work your way to the belly. Notice the breath in the belly. Are you carrying any tension in your feet? And as you scan your body and you send breath to those parts of your body that may be calling your attention, just take note of what you feel. And I invite you to set an intention for tonight um, maybe something you want to notice or whatever it is for you. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I think we can all open our eyes and, uh, I know I, I spoke about the text a little bit, but, um, Emily will be sharing her screen with us tonight with the text on it. And um, so I'll pass it over to Emily so Thank that we you. can begin the joint reading, of course. Thank you. I know I really needed to take those breaths. Felt really, really good. So yeah, I was well. feeling very hyper. So it, gro <laughs> yeah. it grounded my hyperness a little. And yeah. uh, just to refresh everybody's um, memory, um, we're suggesting that we do this reading collectively in that um, we'll put the text up and then I'd love to begin and I'll uh, read until I feel like stopping, <laughs> then someone else please join in. And we're inviting people not to be nervous if there's breaks, like if somebody doesn't right away jump in, that's fine, you know, we're we're using our hands, we're embroidering, we're holding space for the text. Um, but we'd, we'd love to just leave it informal, but the text will be there and whoever wants to read next, please jump in. Awesome, thanks Lauren. I'll, I'll pull up the text now. Thanks Emily. Great to see you Sarah. I'm really happy to be here, hi everyone. <laughs> Okay. So, the story of landscapes is both easy and hard to tell. Sometimes it relaxes readers into somnolence, making us think we're not learning anything new. This is a result of the unfortunate wall we've built between concepts and stories. We can see this, for example, in the gap between environmental history and science studies. Science studies scholars, science studies scholars unpracticed in reading concepts through stories don't bother with environmental history. Consider, for example, Stephen Pine's fine work on fire in the making of landscapes. 
because his concepts are embedded in his histories, science studies, wait, in his history, science studies scholars remain uninfluenced by his radical suggestions on geochemical agency. Pauline Peters' trenchant analysis of how the logic of the British enclosure system came to Botswana range management, or Kate Shower's surprising findings about erosion control in Lesotho, could revolutionize our notions of normal science, but they have not. Such refusals impoverish science studies, encouraging the play of concepts in a reified space. Distilling general principles, theorists expect that others will fill in the particulars, but filling in is never so simple. This is an intellectual apparatus that shores up the wall between concepts and stories, thus indeed draining the significance of the sensitivity science study scholars try to refine. In what follows then, I challenge readers to notice concepts and methods within the landscape histories I present. Telling stories of landscape requires getting to know the inhabitants of the landscape, human and not human. This is not easy, and it makes sense to me to use all the learning practices I can think of including our combined forms of mindfulness, myths and tales, livelihood practices, archives, scientific reports and experiments. But this hodgepodge creates suspicions, particularly indeed with the allies I hailed in reaching out to anthropologists of alternative world makings. For many cultural anthropologists, science is best regarded as a straw man against which to explore alternatives such as indigenous practices, to mix scientific and vernacular forms of evidence invites accusations of bowing down to science. Yet, this assumes a monolithic science that digests all practices into a single agenda. Instead, I offer stories built through layered and disparate practices of knowing and being. If the components clash with each other, this only enlarges what such stories can do. At the heart of the practices I'm advocating are arts of ethnography and natural history. The, the new alliance I propose is based on commitments to observation and fieldwork and what I call noticing. Human disturbed landscapes are ideal spaces for humanist and naturalist noticing. We need to know the histories humans have made in these places and the histories of non-human participants. Satoyama restoration advocates were exceptional teachers here. They revitalized my understanding of, quote, disturbance as both coordination and history. They showed me how disturbance might initiate a story of the life of the forest. Disturbance is a change in environmental conditions that causes a pronounced change in an ecosystem. Floods and fires are forms of disturbance. Humans and other living things can also cause disturbance. Disturbance can renew ecologies as well as destroy them. How terrible a disturbance is depends on many things, including scale. Some disturbances are small. A tree falls in the forest, creating a light gap. Some are huge. A tsunami knocks open a nuclear power plant. Scales of time also matter. Short-term damage may be followed by exuberant regrowth. Disturbance opens the terrain for transformative encounters, making new landscape assemblages possible. Humanists 
not used to thinking with disturbance, connect the term with damage. But disturbance, as used by ecologists, is not always bad and not always human. Human disturbance is not unique in its ability to stir up ecological relations. Furthermore, as a beginning, disturbance is always in the middle of things. The term does not refer us to a harmonious state before disturbance. Disturbances follow other disturbances. Thus, all landscapes are disturbed. Disturbance is ordinary. But this does not limit that term. Raising the question of disturbance does not cut off discussion, but opens it, allowing us to explore landscape dynamics. Whether a disturbance is bearable or unbearable is a question worked out through what follows it, the reformation of assemblages. Disturbance emerged as a key concept in ecology at the very same time that scholars in the humanities and social sciences were beginning to worry about instability and change. On both sides of the humanist naturalist line, concerns about instability followed after the post-World War II American enthusiasm for self-regulating systems, a form of stability in the midst of progress. In the 1950s and 1960s, the idea of ecosystem equilibrium seemed promising. Through natural succession, ecological formations were thought to reach a comparatively stable balance point. In the 1970s, however, attention turned to disruption and change, which generate the heterogeneity of the landscape. In the 1970s too, humanists and social scientists began worrying about the transformative encounters of history, inequality, and conflict. Looking back, such coordinated changes in scholarly fashion might have been early warning of our common slide into precarity. As an analytic tool, disturbance requires awareness of the observer's perspective just as with the best tools in social theory. Deciding what counts as disturbance is always a matter of point of view. From a human's vantage, the disturbance that destroys an anthill is vastly different from that obliterating a human city. From an ant's perspective, the stakes are different. Points of view also vary within species. Rosalind Shaw has elegantly shown how men and women, urban and rural, and rich and poor, each conceptualize floods differently in Bangladesh because they are differenti differentially affected by rising waters. For each group, the rise exceeds what is bearable and thus becomes a flood at a different point. No single standard for assessing disturbance is possible. Disturbance matters in relation to how we live. This means we need to pay attention to the assessments through which we know disturbance. Disturbance is never a matter of yes or no. Disturbance refers to an open-ended range of unsettling phenomena. Where is the line that marks off too much? With disturbance, this is always a problem of perspective based in turn on ways of life. Since it is already infused with attention to perspective, I am unapologetic about my use of the term disturbance to refer to the distinctive ways the concept is used in varied places. I learned this layered usage from Japanese forest managers and scientists who constantly stretch European and American conventions, even as they use them. Disturbance is a good tool with which to begin the inconsistent layering of global and local expert and vernacular knowledge layers I have promised. Disturbance brings us into heterogeneity, a key lens for landscapes. Disturbance creates patches, each shaped by diverse conjectures. Conjunction, conjunctures may be initiated by non-living disturbance, for example, floods and fires, or by living creators, creatures, disturbances. 
As organisms make intergenerational living spaces, they redesign the environment. Ecologists call the effects of, that organisms create on their environments ecosystems engineering. A tree holds boulders in its roots that otherwise might be swept away by a stream. An earthworm enriches the soil. Each of these is an example of ecosystems engineering. If we look at the interactions across many acts of ecosystems engineering, patterns emerge. Organizing assemblages, unintentional design. This is the sum of the biotic and abiotic ecosystems engineering, intended and unintended, beneficial, harmful, and of no account within a patch. Species are not always the right units for telling the life of the forest. The term multi-species is only a stand-in for moving beyond human exceptionalism. Sometimes individual organisms make drastic interventions, and sometimes much larger units are more able to show us historical action. This is the case, I find, for oaks and pines, as well as mat Matsusatake, oaks which interbreed readily and with fertile results across species lines confuse our dedication to species. But of course, what units one uses depends on the story one wants to tell. To tell the story of Matsutake forests forming and dissolving across continental shifts and glaciation events, I need pines as a protagonist in all their marvelous diversity. Pinus is the most common Matsutake host. When it comes to oaks, I stretch even farther, embracing Lithocarpus, tan oaks, and Castanopus, chinquapin, as well as Quercus oaks. These closely related genera are the most common broadleaf hosts for Matsutake. My oaks, pines, and matsutake are thus not identical within their group. They spread and transform their storylines, like humans in diaspora. This helps me to see action in the story of assemblage. I follow their spread, noticing the worlds they make. Rather than forming an assemblage because they are a certain type, my oaks, pines, and matsutake become themselves in assemblage. Traveling with this in mind, I investigated matsutake Taki forests in four places, Central Japan, Oregon, USA, Yunnan, South, uh, Southwest China, and Lapland, Northern Finland. My small immersion in the Satoyama restoration helped me see the, that foresters in each place had different ways of doing forests. In contrast to the Satoyama, humans were not part of forest assemblages in, Mat in Matsutake management in the United States and China. Managers there leap to anxieties about too much human disturbance, not too little. In contrast to, to Satoyama work, forestry elsewhere was measured on a yardstick of rational advancement. Could the forest make futures of scientific and industrial productivity? In distinction, a Japanese Satoyama aims 
for a livable here and now. But more than comparison, I seek histories through which humans, Matsutake and Pine create forests. I work the conjunctures to raise unanswered research questions rather than to create boxes. I look for the same forest in different guises. Each appears through the shadows of the others. Exploring this simultaneously, single and multiple formation, the next four chapters take me into pines. Each illustrates how ways of life develop through coordination and disturbance. As ways of life come together, patch-based assemblages are formed. Assemblages, I show, are scenes for considering livability, the possibility of common life on a human disturbed earth. Precarious living is always an adventure. Thanks everyone for reading. Um, so now I think uh, we're going to move on to, um, we wanna start the reading with a breath and end it with a breath practice. So we're gonna do another breath practice, but this one is uh, kind of more of an activity. So the reading as we see talks a lot about patchy assemblages. Um, and so, you know, Singh states that in each case of Matsutake ecology and economy she embarks on, she finds herself surrounded by patchiness that is a mosaic of open-ended assemblages of entangled ways of life, with each further entering into a mosaic of temporal rhythms and spatial arcs. Uh, I love the description of life as a temporal rhythm, especially when thinking about life and breath. Um, so tonight I wanna to highlight breath as an audible vessel of rhythm by way of uh, Ujjayi breath, also known as ocean breath or victorious breath. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Ujjayi breath, it's been used, it's used for thousands of years um, in yogi practices. And uh, it's because the sound of Ujjayi breath helps us to synchronize um, breath with movement. And although we're not moving, right now we still have like you know our seated posture so with ujjayi breath basically you breathe in and out with the nose and lips sealed so no breath passes the lips uh this serves to build heat in the body and the lips gently close although the breath is passing through the nostrils the emphasis is in your throat so i was taught you ujjayi breath by taking your hand and moving it closely to your mouth like so so it's almost like a handheld mirror so we can all try that. Um, and what you're gonna do is you're going to breathe in through your nose deeply. And as we exhale, breathe out like you're fogging a mirror. This is just to get down the rhythm in the throat. So you inhale. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so now we're gonna try it again, but closing our mouth. So we're still producing that throat fogging sound, um, but this time the air is releasing from your nostrils. So we inhale. So the experiment I want us to do is I'll turn our mics on um, if you're cool with that. Uh, I think if I want us all to turn our mics on because I want to create a patchy assemblage of breath kind of. So I'm thinking about this as us making a collaborative song and kind of one fluid breath, but made up at, as an of assemblage of several different breaths, the same way that Singh talks about landscape as patchy assemblages. So um, we can also like all go on our own tempos. We don't have to have our breaths in sync. Everyone can kind of do their own thing, but I think it would be fun to listen to each other's breaths as well. And if somebody wants to breathe like <laughs> too, or if you want to do lion's breath, which is, <laughs> you could do that too. Like 
whatever you're called to or whatever sound you want to bring to this thing is cool. Uh, lunar breath, cool. Thank you, Rochelle. That was another name. All right, so everybody ready to begin? Um, yeah, jump in. Okay, um, yeah, that was a fun experiment. Thank you for participating in that breath <laughs> practice. Um, I'll be interesting to hear what it sounds like in the, in the recording afterward. So um, before we begin with a large group discussion about the current reading, we're gonna break out into breakout rooms of three to four people to start the discussion for about six minutes. So if you don't wanna participate, please sign off now as we don't want to assign people to an empty room. Um, and before we get into those breakout rooms, I just wanna read some discussion questions for tonight. So what are some ways in which Singh's reformulation of disturbance ecology as possibility changes the way we might think about the precarity of breath? Additionally, can Singh's Matsutake model provide us a guide to resistance against suffocation? If so, how? And how can we apply Singh's text to our own situated landscapes? Um, we embody particular collective Pakshi assemblages. The Matsutake mushroom speaks to a particular landscape. So can we think of possible guides that may pertain more specifically to our own collective spaces and stories? And I'll put these questions in the chat so that uh, other people can see so that you can see in the breakout rooms as well. <clears throat> and I will open up the breakout rooms now. See you in about six minutes. Before I jump into the breakout room, did you not get a signed one? Okay, we are closing out now.
I'm so close to being done. I can't hear you. I think you're on mute. I'm not close to being done. Really? Well, okay. okay. Kind of, maybe. maybe. I, did, I did like an hour last night. Oh, you got ahead. I tried doing it over the weekend and I only got like 15 minutes in. Every little stitch counts. It does. Oh, Len, I don't know how you're working on this because it's taken me a long time. Yes, it's hey, taken. Welcome. Thank you. Let me just double check that we're all back. Yep, looks like we're all back. So, um, at this point, uh, Izzy, if you'd like to read the guidelines. Yes, I'm happy to do so. So um, we're not experts, but inspired generalists. We invite you to join us on the road of becoming more fluent in some of the challenging ideas of our times. Um, we will hold each other's best interest at heart. We hope everyone has come to the table to learn and grow and share. Let's all share responsibility for including all voices in discussion and let's try to stay focused on reading and how it makes us feel. We welcome those of you whose minds are bursting with tangential ideas to write them in the chat bar. In the unlikely event of, of that a disagreement arises, we take this as an opportunity to expand our knowledge rather than defend a position. By staying on this Zoom call, you're agreeing to these community guidelines for our discussion period. And I will put these guidelines in the chat so that um, we can refer back to them if we're wondering what they are. All right, so feel free to hop in the discussion. Anyone who wants to go. Or if anyone would like to share what their individual um, breakout rooms were. Yeah, I just wanted to say that we were lucky enough to be in a breakout room with Izzy and got to see one of these fabulous charts that brings some of the science into the Matsutake method. And it would be, I think it would, it was such a help to see that along with thinking in terms of uh, just the attitude of, of be like a mushroom. <laughs> you know, it was great to see that so I don't know if there's an opportunity to see some of these charts that Izzy put together, but. I'm pretty sure, Izzy, can you screen share one? Yes, I can. I'm just opening that up right now. Thank um, you. Yeah, of course. Let me get that open for us to see. So I'm going to put my screen on. Um, sorry. Here's a chart I created um, just thinking about this mushroom model. Uh, can you all see it just fine? So basically the, the flow is, here's the example of the Matsutake, but this is kind of the flow, the method that Sh Singh is talking about. There's ecological disturbance, then a change in the ecosystem landscape and then new relationships form, creating patchy assemblages of life. And then these transformative encounters of disturbance reveal possibility of life in, the, in capitalist ruins. So this example of the Matsutake shows there's deforestation in Japan during the 18th century. And then uh, red pine germinates in sunlight and mineral soils left by uh, human deforestation. Um, and then because the red pine is germinating, Matsutake begins to thrive because red pine is their most common host. Um, and this process happens by Matsutake wrapping themselves around the roots of the red pine, stimulating growth and taking sugars from the tree. Meanwhile, uh, the Matsutake secrete enzymes that release nutrients from the soil, aiding trees growth. Uh, so in the ruins of deforested landscape emerges new assemblages of life. So this is kind of the Matsutake model that um, 
Singh brings up, and it's about Matsutake's willingness to kind of emerge in these blasted ruins. So how can we, as humans, um, in a, this multi-species universe, think about uh, life emerging in out of capitalist ruins? So yeah, I'm gonna turn my screen share off, but that's the chart, or I can leave it on, whatever. Either way. I think for me, um, what really resonated in the reading um, was the line of telling stories of the landscape requires getting to know the inhabitants of the landscape, um, human and not human, and and really kind of made me think about going into uh, a forest and all the other parts of the forest that exist besides just myself. And additionally, um, how disturbance is the change in the environment, and it is neither bad nor good it's a part of change and so that was really an um, interesting concept to understand i'm gonna jump in there and and second that uh disturbance ecology uh revision of the word disturbance from from being um, something you want to avoid to being something that's a part of the web of life. Um, and I, I always am amazed that when we're talking about landscape and telling the story of a landscape that we're in a way um, challenged by the brevity of human life in relationship to the amount of time that transforming landscapes take. So, for example, the Owens Dry Lake in Payahunadu, named by the Paiutes as a place there was always will always be water, is an example of a place that many times in glacial time history was dry and then full of water, and then dry and then full of water. So it was and was disturbed by evaporation and then rehydration many times. It was also a place that in the early part of uh, the 20th century had a massive earthquake, which um, created a rift in the dry lake and the whole shape of the lake transformed. We're talking about a hundred mile lake. Um, or, you know, uh, reading um, McPhee's uh, book about the, the a geological story of the Americas, um, and I think it's called Chronicles. I can't remember the title, but he talks about how everything from L Lake Lahontan, which is around Lake Tahoe, to the Great Salt Lake, used to be a, an inland sea. And so that was all underwater and all that undulating um, potholes of the Great Basin are, are like the bottom of the ocean. So it was this great inland sea, massive. And there was this big earthquake that created the Colorado River. So all of that water that was in the sea became part of this huge river that forms, you know, the West. And the water that you couldn't see went underground to form underneath the crest of the Great Basin, a massive water table that supports the massive desert. So again, not only are we struggling with how short life is, but how small we are, because if we get slightly higher, we can see that the whole Great Basin is full of uh, life, but it's spaced far apart because of the 
the network of water. And we'll be we'll be reading about that next week when we look at Rebecca Solnit's Savage Dreams about the uh, nuclear arms testing in the Great Basin um, as a form of disturbance ecology. But I did kind of want to kind of bring up this this Great Basin dialectic with the Great Lakes, right? So we have the 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 largest freshwater source in the North American and one of the biggest in the world at the Great Lakes, which is surrounded by nuclear <laughs> reactors, coke piles, and industrial ag, right? Like the, it, it, it's the same as the whole Great Basin. So if you look at the continent as these big swaths of disturbance ecology, then you kind of understand um, this idea of this reading series and the idea of suffocation. I think, yeah, this this idea of timescales is super important when you get to thinking about assemblages, you know, in, in in the ruins of the particular kinds of disturbances that we've done before, because in a lot of cases, whether it's species being um, adapted to operating on a certain uh, time scale or having relations with other species on a certain interactions on a certain time scale, that and whether it's you know human systems being able to uh, move or create new disturbances or do what they do on the time scale that we're able to, um, that is really what makes or severs the ability of new assemblages to form. Diego, as somebody who watches the pattern of birds migration, does this idea of patch, uh, patch ecology connect to your observations of the flights of birds? Like, are they moving from patch ecologies to patch ecologies? Well, I mean, they're being forced or being channeled into using um, the areas that are that are coming up that have historically never, you know, existed in that particular way because there are just there their new assemblages. Um, and so that, I, I think, again, it's a matter of time. Um, those migration patterns, those tendencies that they have are that way because they are responding to um, a particular kind of assemblage that was there for a very, very long time. And it's it's still, what I guess what we're seeing now is, is a process of, of change in patterns, but we don't know exactly where the changes can end up. But I think that's sort of the point of, of any of this systems assemblage thinking about ecology is that now we don't know, we don't, we're not predicting into the future. We're just sort of um, existing in, in the communities that we have now. Yeah, yeah, the Salton Sea is a really good example about that. Um, I don't know too much about the particulars of uh, when it was uh, a body of water and when it wasn't a body of water, but it's oscillated between those two and for different reasons. And in every time it's made that change, it's affected um, birds, especially because it's such a, as a body of water, it's a really important um, habitat during migration. Diego, could you uh, explain how you're using the word assemblage? Uh, I don't, I'm not understanding. That. Well, I was, I was using it in the way that um, was really laid out very well on that chart that Izzy put up. Um, for example, the interactions, the associations between the pine trees and the Matsutake mushrooms. Um, I guess the way that I would define an assemblage is just a a set of interactions that that go on between um, a couple different species or a couple different agents um, of any kind uh, that have a tendency to either 
make it such that they can continue to be held together in that way or uh, provide ground or substrate for new assemblages, new relationships to grow out of. So that they're isolated but in terms of how we're looking at them, not that these are the only things that grow in this one part. Y yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you really get down to it, everything is the same assemblage, but it's just like anything else, a matter of looking at particulars at, at a certain time. I have a question for you, Diego. Um, you said that um, that it's unpredictable um, about the migrating birds now. Um, how is it? Uh, how is it predictable in the past, and why has it become unpredictable? Well, it was predictable in the past because the migration patterns are tied to really closely to climate and local ecology um, at different latitudes, at least in North America. Um, but given that now we're leaving the previous climatic regime we were in, um, those communities, because of shifting temperatures and climate change, are going to be changing. Um, that's going to change the ecology of those local assemblages or, or communities at different, you know, levels or different latitudes, you might even say, at along North America. And then that influences what the birds are responding to, where they need to be at a certain time, where they can be, where they can um, be successful. Um, and because we don't know the effects of the new climatic regime that we're in on the ecosystems that are descended from a different climatic system, we can't really predict how that's going to happen and, and what the birds are going to end up having to deal with or adapt to. Thank you. Emily, we spent a lot of time looking at that word assemblage. Yeah. Do you uh, do you want to talk about it, or do you have your fancy notebook that describes it? Oh, let me uh, let me take a look. Patch patch assemblage is uh, very kind of like like a fairy garden, you know, <laughs> where you've got like all kinds of things that inter connect with it, but on a large, large scale. So it it's relational by nature. So you form patches because like mycelium love plants. And if you create the kind the context for a mycelial plant synthesis, you're going to start to create this kind of loamy net that tends to become host for all kinds of yeasts and bacteria that set up shop in that loamy net. And um, before you know it, that net begins to breathe in sunlight and breathe out oxygen. And life on Earth as we kn knew it happened in these patch ecologies of something called stromatolites, which were kind of like land corals that were made by glacial time layering of fungal roots, dust, little tiny rocks, plant roots, yeast, bacteria, mycelium, and then in extremophiles came, which are animals that thrive in extreme conditions. Um, sometimes monocultures of them would emerge where nothing else could form that make those patch ecologies particular to that specific niche. So, the, the book that Annette Singh has written is about sensitizing our eye to realizing that landscape that you might be moving through might be like a patchwork quilt of different ecologies. And you can kind of see it when you fly over to the East Coast and it's a clear day and you're looking, you can almost count the different numbers of ecologies that you, that you fly over out the window. Yeah, I think also um, the 
the ecological uh, patchwork assemblage. And then Singh also is doing this really cool thing with like different assemblages of knowledge bringing, and we talked about this a little in our breakout room where she's bringing in, you know, oral history and oral stories, like the oral story that the Matsutake mushroom was the first thing to emerge out of the blasted ruins of Hiroshima or the histories of um, like the poems from hundreds of years ago in Japan talking about Matsutake mushrooms or the stories that she's told from the foragers or different things that scientists are telling her or so it's a lot it's like a patchwork assemblage too even the photographs that she uses in the books are she explains as part of that assemblage so I think it's cool how the book itself functions as like this patchwork of knowledge too kind of mimicking the ecology that it's um, writing about Yeah, assemblage and, and precarity seem like words that are coming up in many of the texts that we have been researching, which is very interesting. These two, these two ideas together, pre precarity and assemblage. And I also think about assemblage in the, the context of an artist pulling different materials together to create something. Are you muted, Lauren? Yeah. I was just saying, just by good luck, you're on the page that we love so much about sound. Really? Yeah. Because Amazing. she's she's connecting the idea visually of a patch ecology to, to an oral experience of polyphonic assemblage. So you can imagine, like what Izzy took us through with breath, that if we all we're an organism that had our own unique respiration. And when you put us all together, we would be like a patch assembly of polyphonic life forms. Yes. So you can imagine hearing that and understanding like assemblage from, from that. Yeah, love so, that. I think that she's also trying to help us empathize for the interdependence of all living things at this moment that we're moving through the sixth mass extinction, because we're all in this together. So the reduction of life forms affects many more things than any particular species being no longer here. So I think her her abilities with language to describe this interrelationship through this idea of assemblage and using a sound metaphor as well is kind of helpful because it brings us to kind of a greater bodily understanding of what we're living through, which, you know, 
again, is something we're trying to bring into this reading series about suffocation is that we need to learn about this through hearing each other's voices and through breathing and through assimilating that knowledge with our hands and through crafting because these ideas just coming at your through your head are it's kind of like calisthenics like it's good to keep your mind alert but to actually really take this on as a conversation um you know we're we're, we're trying to explore how you feel about hearing these texts and about this language and um this way that language builds not only understanding, but empathy. Empathy and perspective were themes that came up in our small group discussion, especially the idea of taking a view of the individual body as landscape and particularly through the breath work, exploring a personal landscape without judgment and with empathy and compassion in the same way we tend to experience natural landscapes. And for me, that was also resonant with some of the themes of the scale of a human lifetime and the idea that for me is personally overwhelming when I think about how much damage our species has done to the planet within my own lifetime. And if I live my lifetime again, if I'm lucky enough to do that, will we be able to repair that? Probably not. However, taking the long view we can, things do regenerate, the water comes and goes, but there will always be water. And so from that perspective, I think we do have reasons for optimism and it reaffirms my own sense of purpose in the importance of work to preserve and connect and cherish what we, what we have. This is a gentle way of teaching. I'm grateful. The whole concept of having us breathe together and doing handiwork and listening and studying. It's very gentle. Thank you.
you're mending right now, you might not be able to see the chat bar, but it's exploding with ideas and thoughts. Um, if you'd like to um, share, uh, save it, there's a button where you can share that. But um, at this moment, um, before Izzy closes with a poem, I thought I would share what we've been working on. I can say that I actually finished my embroidery tonight and I'll be starting a new one next week. So we have one white sage done. And then if anybody would like to introduce themselves or share what they're working on at this moment, if you didn't have the opportunity before, we'd love to hear from you and, and see what you've um, embroidered or ended. Jen, can you show yours again so I can pin yours? Wow. Beautiful. It's beautiful. So delicate. It's kind of mossy. Yeah. I feel like I can smell it through the screen. Mossy sage. <laughs> That's a good band name. <laughs> it is. I'd like it on pasta. Extreme of Files is a pretty good band. Yeah. <laughs> Jen, will you hold up that B again, the one behind you? I just need another look at that. I have to tell you, I'm gonna hold it up for a couple extra seconds. You really need to let some pin it to see it. It's it's extraordinary. It's like the B. And Walker will probably appreciate it. Yeah. Being a B. This is for I Walker. It's yeah. Dimensional, and it's it actually like it. it oh my gosh. I don't know if the lighting's good, but <gasps> look at the. Whoa. It's like you can feel the fuzz. Yeah. I can't believe it. And the writing is so beautiful. Okay, and I'm gonna go in really close, see if you can really see the yeah. like the I love it. Look at the little feet. Oh <laughs> my god. It's like little high heels. Oh my god, it's like the ruby slippers. And then look at the detail in the wings. It's queen unbelievable. Bee. Gorgeous. Native bumblebee. Inspiring. Look at that. I need a needle and some embroidery thread right away ASAP. <laughs> so the, the embroidery for this unit, uh, for this study session, biosynosis is kind of a patch assemblage uh, piece. It, it, it's got, um, maybe Jen can Absolutely. hold it up again. This is the drawing. And you can see that it's got um, various um, wow. winged creatures and flowers in moonlight, uh, a melon or a gourd, a sphinx moth, um, and these are all observations from our project site we call the moon. So this was the beginning of thinking of a patch assemblage or what's called biosynosis, which is the interrelationship of all the living systems in a place. Wow. If anybody wants to try their hand at embroidering this complex image. Can we simplify it? You know what? There <laughs> are no alive. rules. There are no rules you can do. You could send back a big red circle. It would be fine. So how do we get the copy of the? We will send it to you um, with um, the embroidery hoop and thread and needles. Is that Walker? Oh, yeah. I have those things. So I just you... need the drawing. OK, we will we'll get it to you. Awesome. Thanks. Are you in LA or Mexico? I'm here now. Okay. I, I'm going back and forth we, pretty much weekly. Okay. I'm here today. Good to see you. You too. Those colors really are spectacular, Jen, on the bee. Oh, it, it, it's incredible. It's, it's very thin. It looks it, almost like she used one block like broke apart the six strands into one because the detailing, it's extraordinary. I, I, 
can only imagine how many um, stitches are in there. And okay, I have to show this off because I'm gonna tell you right now. <laughs> this, this is my back. It's it's a mess. It's it's a mess. It's, it's very chaotic, <laughs> but, but it works because it's it's nice on this side. I just yeah. have to. It's like so clean on the wow. back. That's crazy. It's, it's, wow. It impressed me. I was like, how do you do that? I, each time I do an embroidery, I think this time the back is going to be perfect. And then yeah. like 10 minutes into it, like there's these knots that happen and it goes crazy and hey, why aren't I think, okay, the next one, the next one's going to be perfect. But this is just, it's, you, it's the detailing on the back is it's just as magical as the front. Wow. Walker. Can you send me your email? I mean, sorry, not your email, your address so that we can mail you an embroidery. Yes, I think I just need the drawing. I have supplies. Okay. So if you wanted, you could just email me the drawing. Yep, we could totally do that. Okay. That would be great. Super. Okay. We can even just put it on the chat bar, right? Yeah. Yes. We so we'll all have that same drawing for the next round. It won't. That's be an option. We also still have all of the native plants, you know. But if you want to try, if you're inspired to try that new one, oh that's our God. new one for this two month two month period. And then um, Diego and I are working on a larger biosynosis collage for the next reading series. Because so. wasn't there a rumor about birds? Oh, yeah, we do have some birds too. Would you like a bird? I would like a bird, please. That can be arranged. We have, Diego has drawn three different birds. Oh, great. We could show them, right? Yeah, let's Maybe yeah, we could screen share it. it. I want to see the birds. Could we, Jen? Yeah, let me just find them real fast. Hold on one second. I'm making uh, life complicated for you. Yeah, I apologize. No I also have them. If oh, Diego's here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what? I could. I don't know if I could pull yeah. them up faster than Jen can, but actually, I got him. Yay! So here's one. I'm gonna have to. Wow! Oh, look at that beautiful creature. Bravo! Oh, I love it. Thank you. That is stunning. Oh. Diego, will you tell us about it? Um, that one's a yellow rumped warbler, and I drew it with uh, manzanita next to it. That would be so beautiful as an embroidery, wow. don't you think? Yeah. Yes. So, Diego, what color is um? is that is it all yellow oh yeah i meant to to include the the reference pictures and the colors too but um it's mostly gray and yellow on the bird and then green on the leaves and then sometimes manzanita has almost red reddy brown branches yeah too. that's true yeah. that's definitely true that's what yeah. it looks like yeah i'll pull up another one so let me do the next one here's this one Oh, nice. That one's simpler. Uh, it's from <laughs> a painting that I had done. I, I think I, I need a common raven. Yeah. <laughs> down for one. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just screenshotting them all. <laughs> nice. Okay, we have another one. Let me, I'll close this one. These are so great. And Thank you. Here's the next one. Oh, look at those yeah. sweet eyes. The oh, eyes are so fantastic. Yeah. Thanks. I, I did it based off of a picture that I took of this bird. Is that graphite? Um, No, I, I, I drew it digitally on a table. Oh, OK. <laughs> really, that's digital. Did you use the <laughs> What was that? Sorry, I didn't. Did you use Illustrator? Uh, no, I use uh, I use an app called Procreate. Okay. It's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's so fantastic. It's exquisite. The plant and the bird. It's such. Thank you. I appreciate it. 
Yeah, sign me up for the hermit thrush, Jen. Me <laughs> too, <laughs> Jen, please. I want that one. <laughs> I think you're all very brave. <laughs> Well, it's true. These these I can, look I can make them less lined out and detailed next time. I yeah. think these are pretty good. Um, and, and you can improvise on the drawing too. It doesn't need to be exactly what's there. Super. We will not be grading anybody on uh their <laughs> embroidery. <laughs> promise? This is not yeah. a this is not a um a container it's a it's a place for new embroideries to come out of there you go wow beautiful hmm Does anyone else have any more embroideries to share? This is the same one I went, I started a little bit more, but that's the same one I'm working on. Wait, Cindy, can you hold it a little bit higher so I could see the butterfly? Okay. Wow. There. The wow, that Hi. purple. Those, co those that colors purple, are amazing. The purple is so beautiful. Yeah. Stained glass. It does look like stained glass. Like stained glass. Gorgeous. Thank you. Beautiful, Cindy. Thank you. Nice. I'm just getting started on a white sage. Let's see. Oh, hold it up just a little. Ooh. Look at That's that. That's beautiful. I like the colors. Very nice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. they, the white sage looks kind of blue to me when I look at a real one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hold it up again. Sylvia, I, just, I missed it. I've been unpinning and repinning and getting it over to you. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, beautiful. Thanks. Well, thank you, everyone. I had a I had a really good time, and the reading was really great this time. Thank you so much, Diego, for joining us, and hopefully see you next week for of the Salnet book. Thank Thanks you then. so much, everyone. Bye, Diego. Great to have you, Diego. Goodbye. Thanks. Bye. Good night. Stay warm. <laughs> On that note. Um, would do, do you guys want me to share the poem I selected for this week? That would be yeah. great. I'm, okay, great. So this week I selected a poem um, titled Intimate Dawn by a poet named Linda Noel from the Konkau tribe. And um, it's from this text, which I've been getting a lot of the poems from. Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California. So I will read it. Intimate Dawn. Through the moist windows of this landscape, I am unfamiliar with your home. As dim light breaks, white veils with the coming dawn, the terrain of your flesh slopes over slick city hills. I traverse looking for light. As wind breaks the heavy white breath from the sea, our breath is the rhythm of waves ridden between bodies and the rocking of the bent cypress tree against the stucco of your small house 
is a wind of our own created by the hurried and hungry motion of our journey through the departing night. And I shall remember the smell of fog in late fall and the scent of our wet bones bent together. Yeah, that's the poem. Izzy, could you I read it again? Can you read it once more? I was sort of half spacing out. And can you tell me again what the who the author was? Yes, the author is named Linda Noel. And there's a little bio of her in the back of this text. I can uh, read parts of briefly. It's fairly short. Um, she's of uh, Concow descent and grew up in Mendocino County. And she resides in California where she's a poet. So yeah, I can read it again. The poem is called Intimate Dawn. Through the moist windows of this landscape I'm unfamiliar with, your home as dim light breaks white veils with the coming dawn, the terrain of your flesh slopes over slick city hills. I traverse looking for light as wind breaks the heavy white breath from the sea our breath is the rhythm of waves ridden between bodies and the rocking of the bent cypress tree against the stucco of your small house is a wind of our own created by the hurried and hungry motion of our journey through the departing night. And I shall remember the smell of fog in the late fall and the scent of our own wet bones bent together. Beautiful. And I'm happy to share um, if anybody wants to see the, uh, I have the poem scanned, I can put up for anybody who wants to look at it. Oops. I'm going to say good night to everyone. And thank you for the reading tonight and for the good company conversation and sharing work. It was lovely. Have a good week. Good night. Junie!
little Junie's here. Cute baby alert. Cute baby alert. Cute baby. Wanna say hello? <laughs> hi. Hi, Junie. Oh, hi. Oh, I want some of that. What's yeah. it, what's going on in there? Is that is that is that like sherbet? Oh no, it's purple broccoli, purple a uh, cauliflower. Yep. <laughs> I yeah. wanted it to be raspberry sherbet. Me too. That sounds good. <laughs> I could get into that. Yeah. Erin, do you have any raspberry sherbet in the freezer that you could bait us with? Can I wish. Send it via hologram, please. Yes. Next week, we're going to be sending breath of raspberry sherbet to everybody. <laughs> We've done fire. We're moving on to ice cream. Oh my God. <laughs> That's a big right, Junie. That's a, That's big a lot one. of cabbage. You can do it. You want a little piece? I think he's got the winning square. <laughs> yeah. This is my kind of reality TV. Yeah. <laughs> June Cam. Do you want some, some cauliflower? No. Cabbage. I see a cute little creature in another background of a Zoom screen. The little, same screen? No, a different one. A little sleepy. Really? Oh, oh yeah. What type of animal is that? In JT Square, there's a creature. Oh my God! Look at that baby. <laughs> is that a spaniel? I have a creature. Is it, is it my babies? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. So Mr. is the cat and he's in a little lump. <laughs> oh my God. He looks so relaxed. Yeah. He's, he's an orange and white Chicago alley cat and he's about 16. <gasps> and then this one, this one taken up the rest of the bed <laughs> is Lolly. Oh. <laughs> Lolly's about six Where's and a couple of different kinds of pit bull and um, probably some blue healer. Oh. Um, made of magic, of course, both of them. They're my, they're my buddies. And hi, I'm Jesse. Hi, <laughs> Jesse. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you too. Good to meet you. Kaya for a second. Say it again. Kaya is there too. Hmm. She's, she's over in Alex's window. Oh, cool. And Malia. Admiring uh, Juniper eating cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah there's kaya oh emily don't even show me that cuteness i got a sleeping boy right here oh. keep chilling <laughs> he's on my feet susan where's molly um, she's out barking at coyotes right now. Oh, okay. Wow. The rest of the gun there. <laughs> I can hear them. <laughs> I can hear them. Food. Have some more food. <laughs> Just throw it back there. <laughs> Emily, you should embroider some of your basement moss into and oh, that's a really cool idea. I like that. Yeah. Really cool. And it would smell and feel awesome too. It smells so good, the moss. It really does. You could do bog embroideries. <laughs> Here's one more. Oh, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> she's, in, she's 
uh, our new family addition. Her name Aww. is Dixie. What's your name? Dixie. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> about, what do you think? Five, maybe five months? Oh. Oh my God, she's beautiful. Look at yeah, those eyes. Beauty. Exotic. A beautiful tail. <laughs> Very that fluffy. beautiful eye makeup. How are your allergies? <laughs> Oh yeah, they're bad. I can't <laughs> tell it's really stopping her. Yeah, I'm, on, I'm on daily inhalers and daily um, medication. Nice. On the theme of suffocation. Well, yeah. It hurts. It does. I do, I do it for the children. I have two cats and two dogs now. Wow. What type of dogs? I have a boxer and I have a uh, little Yorkie. The little oh. tiny one, so cute. Yeah. And then two two of these cats. <laughs> How does the boxer get along with your tiny, tiny dog? He gets along with all of the pets. Oh my God. All of them. Uh, we put her, we put the kitty in the crate. See, here's the little one. <laughs> Oh I love God. it. Look at I that little one. She's about five years old. <laughs> yeah. What's his name? She is uh, Lulu. <laughs> what a cute. The boxer gets along with everybody. He's really friendly. We put the cats inside the kennel with him and they sleep all together. Wow. Yeah. After I do the crow, I might have to do a Lulu embroidery. <laughs> Lulu with bat wings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. <June. laughs> I'm so glad we're recording these because I'm just going to put June on loop for <laughs> till the end of quarantine. <laughs> Juni. Her hair is getting long, Erin. Okay, one last one. I became a grandmother over quarantine. I don't know if you guys can see this. Oh, no, I don't think that you can see Oh, what? who is that? That's Jessica's little baby. Oh, they, my God. I think it's a labradoodle. Oh, yeah, my is. God. <laughs> that creature is too cute. To yeah. exist. There he is. Animal. Oh. Following him on Instagram, I love the daily posts. Oh yeah, he's uh he's Benny Baker Doodle, ba yeah Benny Baker Dude. That's his handle. <laughs> oh, they have it. It has its own account. Yes. yes. Wow. Okay. All right. So wait. I don't know. I'm gonna show you my farm, Walter. Okay. Here. Oh, here comes the boxer. Hi, Walter. Wow. <laughs> I love that Dixie's just falling right behind. <laughs> oh, unmute so we can hear you. Oh, okay. I was saying that's it. That's all of my farm. <laughs> For now, for now, I think like there might be a pony. That. I don't know where the last cat is.
I'm gonna sign off, go set my table, and great to good be night, here. Roxanne. Good night, Roxanne. Good night, Roxanne. Good to see you. Good to see you. Wonderful to be together. Good night, Roxanne. Good night. Also gonna go. Goodbye. I'm Sylvia. See you bye, next Sylvia. time. Bye. See you next bye. week, bye. Sylvia. Okay. Bye. Good night, bye. you guys. Nice seeing you all. Good yeah. to see you, Alex. Bye, Alex. Kaya. Bye, Kaya. <laughs> Oh, oh my god, look at oh. Susan's puppy! Oh my god, Molly! Oh, oh my god. Oh, I have to pin that. Oh my god, he, she's so beautiful. Look at that look. I bet she gets a lot of treats. Look at those oh. eyes. Yeah, she steals a lot of treats. Oh my god, she's so beautiful. Yeah. 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 Aww. She's she was she's a rescue and she's still got her tail <laughs> because they normally cut their tails off. Aww. We saved them. <laughs> we saved all their tails. <laughs> right, Maggie? Oh, she's getting big. <laughs> getting big. Yeah. Also, oh, it's Maggie, not Molly. Yeah, Maggie. I wanted Molly. Actually, it's funny you should say that. But I got out, out voted because I had She to... liked Molly too when you said Molly she kissed you. Hey Molly. She's very yeah. interested in the screen. And that's interesting. Yeah. Well, she's the generation to be a Zoom pup. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's a she, no, she's uh, chewing. So Susan, I saw this image today in uh, the news i'm gonna send it to you it was in siberia and it was near a toxic mine uh -huh. and they found a pack of dogs that are bright turquoise blue what? their fur is is bright blue wow. feral dogs oh. wow i'm gonna send you the story because i was like is this is this a joke no i don't think it is Wow. Like the claymation about the dogs that live in like that. What is that called? They live in like a, the ruined. Uh, I know what you're talking about. It. Um, they live in like basically a desolate, deserted area where only dogs live. And then this little boy who's really important in the real world, like goes in to save the dogs. Is this a Wes Anderson film? Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember the name. But that sounds like a, the pack of like nuclear dogs in the Yeah, in yeah. Russia. Wow. Yeah, it was I think it was Isle of Dogs. Yeah. Wow. That's what it's called. Thank you, Jen. Well, I'm going to sign off. It was wonderful hanging out with y'all and um, meeting you. And this is such a, a wonderful space. Um, thanks for having me and sweet dreams from New Mexico. Well, thanks for joining us. I hope to see you again. Yeah, you sure will. Thanks. Okay. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Here's the blue dog. I'll send it to you. Wait. Oh. That is crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Wow. 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 Here's another one. That is insanity. Whoa. Wow. It's like the blue man group. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is the mirror in the UK like a tabloid? Yeah. Okay. It says Dogs are blue because of high levels of pollution in a dirty river, but it's the mirror, so. That's really sad. It's a, yeah. Maybe they're white dogs that are swimming in the river mm. and they're getting dyed blue. Or maybe yeah. they're aliens. <laughs> 
dropping. Or maybe all the people there are color dystopic, like and the dogs are normal color, but their eyes have filters in them that make them. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say good night because I'm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's probably a good idea yeah. otherwise we might pass another round <laughs> of loony ideas around we're quickly spinning <laughs> into the blue do into the blue dog realm of the it's zoom true. Could get slippery <laughs> to live so <laughs> all right I'll see you next good time hey, good night everyone bye Bye bye. Susan saves all the animals, wild animals of the mountains. She's wow. a, a vet superhero. She deals wow. with all the animals in the forests that get hurt or, you know, she's incredible. That's so cool. Anyway, I thought that was awesome tonight, you guys. It did was you? Great, right? How did how did you feel? Yeah. Like I, I feel. Cool. I think we dialed it in. And I really like your the black background with the uh with the embroidery really punched it out. It definitely did. It definitely did. So I'll I'll continue with that. I think it's a nice touch. It also kind of like makes yeah. you look like. It elevated the whole uh, event. I thought it worked. It worked really well, and I think I think featuring a new one each week is really exciting. Yeah, you can't see what's getting sent in other than us, and I think it's a really great way to build camaraderie around like what everyone's working on. Yeah, and it was really nice to just start right out with. I got this this week. I'm so excited. Like it, it, I think tonight everybody had a chance to settle. Yeah. I was worried that I, the reading was too short, but then I didn't think it was a problem because we just had a more re relaxed conversation. Yeah. Did you think it was too short? I no. didn't. Okay. And, um, the br br breathing work was great. Love it. And. I think everybody got into that really good place. I just didn't feel there was any like edge. I didn't feel any edge either, which is great because last week I was freaking out. Right. It but was I f super chill tonight, I feel like. Yeah. yeah. I think we dialed it into a great place to go from. Yeah, good work. I got plenty more of these to share. Yeah, the Gen Show featured each week. <laughs> yeah, the dance cam, dance cam. <laughs> Love it. And then June had a cameo, like major cameo. That was sweet. Yeah, June cam. June cam. <laughs> <laughs> hi, cutie. Can you say hi? What are you doing right now? <laughs> you drawing pictures? What are you doing, John? You want to say bye bye? <laughs> bye bye. Hi, sweet one. Bye bye, little angel. Say bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. <laughs> Time to take a bath. <laughs> No, it's time for you. All right. Say bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, bye. bye bye. Bye bye. Bonsoir. See you soon. See you soon. There's that contagious yawn. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that was so nice. What a great thing when it goes well. Yeah. It was nice how Sylvia said she appreciated the gentleness. Yeah. It melt, made me feel that people know, have noticed as we mm -hmm. kind of move the event to a different tone, yeah. but without like changing it. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. I thought that 
that, you know, some of the people who've been coming for, you know, many months um, appreciate it. But what happened to Ansu? She's disappeared. I don't know. I don't know. Registered for tonight. Let me look and see. I thought I, thought I saw her name. Yeah, she registered for tonight. So okay. Happened, she, she's on the list. Okay, good. How many people registered tonight? Um, we have... 30, 38, but Joan Borgman had emailed me right before and said that she couldn't make it. So 30, 37. 37 registered and about 25 or 26 came? Yeah. Okay, well, that's pretty close to yeah. people who registered were signing up um, because it was a, the, 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 the flyer art was a big success. Um, we had nearly 200 likes Wow! for that one, which was, it did way better than the first one. What was the first I really one? liked the flyer for this one. I got really excited when I saw it. Oh, good. The, this one was 170 and Dr. Shiva's one was uh, like 120, which was also really good. Yeah. But it's always interesting for me to kind of, try and figure out what because last one Astra Taylor was only like 30 mm -hmm. so I thought well maybe it's because Astra Taylor and the debt collective are not as popular as Anit Singh or Dr. Shiva but also everybody loves a mushroom right that's the thing I got excited when I saw that mushroom embroidery <laughs> I just hit that like button you know <laughs> So that's going to be the trick. Like, I'm like, ooh, what should I do for Savage Dreams? It has to be something that people are going to like, right? Right, right. So I've got two I've got two ones to work with in mind. One is Livia Reiner's um, Roses, you know, the roses. Yeah. Because they're so not what you think of as a Savage Dream, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'm thinking like, you know, like film poster-esque, like savage dreams with the roses. That's one idea. Mm -hmm. The other one is that, you know, that incredible avocado one that was new and it has tons of colors. Yes. Yes. Ooh. Because it's like so ecstatically like bright. It really is. It's got a lot of energy in it. But I'm not sure how I would deal with the text. So, because it's like the whole. Pretty much the whole thing. Yeah. Mm. Or I could do Maya's onion because it looks like a bomb dropping a little bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that's like, like it's not as powerful as a bee. Maybe I should do your bee. I think I scanned this one, actually. I can send you this one. Okay. Because again, everybody likes bees and mushrooms. Everybody does. Can it too? Uh, it's it like it's like when you find there's naked people in your ice cubes when they're selling um, when they're selling like you know health insurance or something, and in the background there's these suggestive scenes going on. <laughs> with this flyer art. It's like I'm like slightly competitive with myself for each right. post. I'm like, okay, right? How could I get? How can I get 200 likes for What's Savage Dreams? <laughs> well, because also Salmit is a superstar too. Totally. Like, like you know, Tsing, they're probably, Salmit's probably a bit more known in a general yeah. public. Right. So we'll see, you know, maybe there's big <laughs> Salmit at Metabolic. Salmit fan club. Right now is a JPEG. Well, good work, you guys. I think yeah, that was super well fun. Tonight. That was yeah. a very nice, nice way to start the weekend. Yeah. Really I'll is. see you in book club, Emily, Monday morning, bright Monday and early. Monday morning, book club. Book, book, book boot camp. We'll be, <laughs> we'll be lifting books. From we'll books. be lifting books. <laughs> Pumping iron books. <laughs> <laughs> All right, take care, you guys. All right, have a good weekend. You too. Bye bye. Bye.